Um, hi everybody. I hope you're all having a great evening. I know I am. And so I hope you are as well. I notice uh, McGreg Mallard and Lana Dell and David Phelps have all joined. Thank you for coming. Russ Gallman has joined as well. Thank you, Russ. And Sam Hollenbeck has joined. Here, what are we talking about tonight? Well, we're talking about okay, analysis and commentary on Bernie's latest uh, tax plan. And we're going to be doing still more impeachment analysis based on some articles that appeared at uh, Truth Dig. I think we want to get impeachment out of our system quickly so we can get back to uh, really important issues of the campaign. So, but I'm starting a transition tonight because I'm doing Bernie's tax plan, which is, of course, an issue. Jill Stevens has joined us, and Jim Rushford has joined as well. Russ says, good evening, and Sam says, how's everyone tonight? Beverly Couch has joined also. Hi, Beverly. Very nice to see you here. Craig says, good evening to everyone, and my daughter, Devorah, has joined. Hi, honey. How are you? Very nice to see you. Okay, so I'm going to start with Bernie's tax plan. The Bernie's tax plan. I'm also going to look at my monitor so I can read things better. So let me do a little bit of an adjustment here. Shift the scene a little. So here we go. The Sanders Income Inequality Tax Plan. So he starts with a very short statement. The American people want corporations to invest in their workers, uh, not just issue dividends, stock buybacks, and outrageous compensation packages to their, uh, the executives. He points out what, uh, what many of us know but too many of us do not know. In the 1950s, CEOs made 20 times more than their median employees. But last year, the average Standard & Poor 500 CEO made 280 times their median worker pay. And then he makes a moral statement, workers in this country should not be paid totally inadequate wages while CEOs make outrageously high compensation packages. He says his plan raises taxes on companies with exorbitant pay gaps between their executives and uh, typical workers. And he gives some examples. Today, the SEC requires companies to disclose their CEA, CEO to median worker pay ratios. As a result, we now know that Walmart CEO made $23.6 million last year, 1,076 times more than the median Walmart workers, 21,900 
and fifty-two dollars. Jamie Dimon made over thirty million last year, three hundred and eighty-one times more than the median J.P. Morgan Chase employee, seventy-eight thousand nine hundred twenty-two. So note, there's a greater degree of equality at J.P. Morgan Chase than there is at Walmart. Home Depot CEO made more than eleven point four million, four hundred and eighty-six times more than the median Home Depot employee's wage of twenty-three thousand three hundred and eighty-nine. And Nike CEO was paid over nine point five million. What a piker! In two thousand eighteen, three hundred seventy-nine times more than the median Nike employee's earnings of twenty-one thousand nine hundred and fifty-five. Uh, were those the earnings of Nike here in the United States, or uh, where they may actually make their sneakers? <laughs> I assume that they have uh, farmed them out to Asia, somewhere in Asia. An American Airlines CEO made almost twelve million last year, one hundred and ninety-five times more than the median American Airlines employees, sixty-one thousand five hundred and twenty-seven. Uh, Yeah. Under the new Sanders tax plan, companies with large gaps between their CEO and median worker pay would see progressively higher corporate tax rates, with the most unequal companies paying five percentage points more in corporate taxes. Specifically, this plan would impose tax rate increases on companies with CEO to median worker ratios above fifty to one. So Bernie is setting a new norm. You can do fifty to one to your median, but you can't do any more than that without paying taxes or paying increased taxes. If the CEO did not receive the largest paycheck in the firm, the ratio will be based on the highest paid employee. And the tax penalties would begin at 0.5 percentage points for companies that pay their top executives between 50 and 100 times more than their typical workers. The highest penalty would kick in for companies that pay top executives over five hundred times their、uh, their worker pay. These rates, if cup current corporate pay patterns continue, would raise around one hundred and fifty billion over ten years. Well, we know from the M and T point of view, what they would do is take a hundred and. A hundred and fifty billion out of the hands of uh, the uh, uh, the uh, the private sector, uh, uh, the CEOs in the private sector, and that during the settlement process, the tax revenues would actually be destroyed by the Federal Reserve. <laughs> We know that's what actually happens. But it would raise 150 billion in the sense of raising 150 billion in increased、um, policy space for the government. So the government、uh, might then be able to run a deficit larger than 150 billion, but maybe not, because. Uh, the CEOs of corporations probably only have a multiplier effect, okay, a primary multiplier effect, on what they earn, of thirty cents on the dollar,、uh, which means there might not actually be a hundred and fifty billion in policy space actually created. It might be more like forty-five、uh, billion. 
instead. But that's another story for another day and another time. Uh, at this point, I have a question. My question would be, how did Bernie arrive at uh, these limits? In other words, why not go back down to 20 to 1? Why not go back down to 30 to 1? Would there be a greater rebellion on the part of the CEOs if they went down to 30 to 1 or to 20 to 1 than if they were forced to go down to 50 to 1? I don't know. I don't know what the right figure is. But from the inequality point of view, we should try to get it down as low as possible. But if your median worker earns, let's say, $60,000 a year, and you're coming in at uh, uh, 30 to 1, then the wage of the CEO or the salary of the CEO would be at a maximum of $1.8 million per year. That still provides people with an awful lot of money to spend. And, of course, the CEOs get a lot more than just their salaries. They also get a bunch of other compensation, too. So we have to talk about that. Is Bernie just talking about salaries, or is, is he talking total compensation? We have to find that out. So, how companies' corporate taxes would increase if their compensation ratio is between 50 and 100 to 1? That would be, again, the half percent. If it were between 100 and 200 to 1, then they would pay 1% of their earnings in corporate tax. If it were between 200 and 300 to 1, then the corporate tax would be 2%. And between 300 and 400 to 1, 3%. Between 400 and 500 to 1, 4%. And more than 500 to 1, as in Walmart, they'd have to sacrifice 5% of their profits if they insisted on uh, the, uh, the ratio. Now, the other thing they could do is that they could raise employee pay. I don't know what the incentive calculus is there, but I'm sure Bernie had some people figure that out. If so, it'd be nice to see the analysis and see what it is likely to say about how corporations um, are likely to respond to this by raising the workers of their wages so as to lower the, uh, the ratios. I guess they get on their spreadsheets and do some simulations. Or maybe they'd use a more sophisticated uh, simulation programs to find the optimum point, the optimum combination of raising uh, their workers' um, the salaries and wages and mixing that up uh, with the lowering of the compensation they pay to their CEOs or their highest paid um, employees. Anyway, Bernie says, if this plan had been in effect last year, then McDonald's would have paid up to $110.9 million more in taxes. Walmart would have paid up to $793.8 million more in taxes. J.P. Morgan Chase would have paid up to $991.6 million in taxes. 
The Home Depot would have paid up to 538.2 million more in taxes, and American Airlines would have paid up to 18.8 million dollars in uh, their taxes. I'd like to see figures like this for Amazon. That would be interesting to see. Anyway, Bernie's plan says this plan would apply to all private and publicly held corporations with annual revenue of more than a hundred million dollars. Treasury Department will be required to issue a, uh, a new regulations to prevent tax avoidance, including by changing the composition of the workforce of a firm. I'm not sure what he means by that, but maybe that's some control um, on the extent to which the firms would be likely to automate in order to actually replace workers. Because that's also okay, a way to get around this. What you do is you automate as much as possible, have many fewer uh, employees, and if the fewer employees are higher paid employees, then the ratio would automatically go down because the median compensation paid would probably be higher because all your unskilled workers would be getting cut. I don't know if this is intended to be a control on that, oh, but if it is, as Bernie has another answer to that. And that answer is uh, the federal job guarantee. Of course, currently he's specifying a wage, which is too low for most areas in the United States. He keeps talking $15 per hour. Uh, he certainly would probably need an average of 20 to 22, and in high cost areas, far more to pay a living wage to people. In addition, the pay ratio data for privately held corporations will be made public in the same manner that it is currently disclosed for publicly held corporations. That's interesting. The revenue generated from this income inequality tax will be used to pay for Bernie's plan to eliminate uh, the uh, medical debt held by people. Uh, okay. Once again, we have to point out that Bernie is still using the idea that taxes pay for things. When people here who've been into um, MMT-based economics uh, know that taxes do not pay for anything. All they do is create um, a policy space for the government to create uh, new net uh, um, financial assets uh, by uh, creating uh, new money in the private sector through federal payments. But the goal of this income inequality tax is not just to raise more revenue. It is, I hope not. It is to send a message to corporate America. Stop paying your workers um, um, inadequate wages while CEOs make outrageous compensation packages. The American people want corporations to invest in their workers, not just pay dividends, do buybacks of stock, and have outrageous compensation packages for their uh, executives. That's what this plan, okay, is all about. I don't know how people are going to respond to this plan. I think, symbolically, okay, it's a good plan. It just may not be strict, may not be strict enough. I'd like to see some, some simulations of the likely impact 
of this plan on corporations. I know simulations are far from the reality that always occurs, but at least it gives us a better way to think about the reforms we're introducing into the um, economy. When all is said and done here, the $150 billion a year uh, that is taken out of the hands of the CEOs uh, doesn't seem to be very significant by itself. Uh, not when sensible expectations are that our federal budgets in the next three, four, five, six years may well go up to nine, ten trillion, maybe even twelve trillion per year if we get serious about the Green um, by the New Deal. So, 150 million is not significant, 150 billion, sorry, it's not significant in itself. Oh, also, it's only 150 billion over 10 years. So per year, it's only 15 billion. So per year, that is nothing in terms of impact on the um, economy. So why would this be useful? It would only be useful if it incentivizes the CEO to actually pay workers more so they could earn more. That would be very good, especially in companies that are earning outrageous profits. In other words, the really important part of this is whether it would be successful in terms of motivating the most successful of our corporations to raise wages. So we really need to have a discussion as to whether this uh, is going to work that way. Why Bernie thinks it's going to work that way. Because the money raised per year is really trivial compared to the size of the federal budget. Well, I don't mind pissing off the CEOs. As you know, I'm rather a fan of that. Um, I would like to piss them off for good reasons. <laughs> Which means that this plan needs to really have some impact in reducing income um, um, inequality at uh, the, uh, the workplace. So we need to see some reasoning on that. We need to see some simulations on that. At first blush, of course. Okay, I love the plan. It's great. But we have to have some reasons to believe that it's really going to be effective. Okay, so we'll move on to impeachment in just a minute. But for now, I'd like to remind you to Please share, like, and subscribe to this Facebook uh, page and to the YouTube channel that this will be posted on soon after the end of this stream. And please become a patron at www.patreon.com front slash Joe underscore Firestone. And now, having delivered the necessary commercial message, 
because we all have to live. Um, I move on to uh, the impeachment analysis. So the first of the articles that I want to comment on is a piece which appeared in Truth Dig and it was written by Bill Blum, who's a frequent contributor to Truth Dick. He's a regular contributor over there. And he has a reputation, okay, he's a progressive, long time uh, progressive for, uh, for many, many years. And he's a pretty good writer. And he goes right out there. He says, I'm not going to bury the lead. Donald John Trump, the 45th president of the United States, is going to be impeached. Not only that, but whether or not the GOP-controlled Senate convicts Trump of, quote, high crimes and uh, high crimes and misdemeanors, unquote. His presidency is drawing to a close uh, unless a political deus ex machina comes to his rescue. He will not serve a second term. Now that's coming right out there with it. That's a prediction. I hope he can predict how long this is going to take because we really need to get back to issues badly. Other than the issue of whether Trump should be impeached. Of course he should be impeached. But we have a lot of other things to do. So we need to get back to issues quickly. So Bill Blum goes on to say, numerous actions and events have brought us to this impeachment precipice, virtually all of them initiated by Trump himself. He's the architect of his own um, demise, and there is no turning back. As of Saturday, some 222 members of the House of Representatives were on record endorsing an impeachment um, investigation. I wonder what the count is today. I haven't been keeping up with this. It's Tuesday, though, already, right? Their ranks included independent uh, Justin Amash, a former Republican, of course, of Michigan, and Republican Mark uh, uh, Amode of uh, Nevada. The first Republican, to my knowledge, uh, to join the ranks of those who are endorsing an impeachment um, investigation. The last ho House high-profile House Democratic holdout, Tulsi Gabbard of Hawaii, announced her support on Friday. The total will only expand in the coming weeks. We don't know yet why Tulsi changed her mind so quickly. That is unlike her. I guess the truth will be coming out. Someone will probably ask her during the debates in October why she changed her mind so suddenly. So one way or another, we'll probably have an answer to that. Trump, for his part, appears increasingly exhausted, um, paranoid, and incoherent, not unlike uh, Richard um, Nixon in the final stages of Watergate. The president is taken to Twitter even more than usual, spewing vitriol and blurting out threats of revenge against his many presumed uh, uh, enemies. For those who are familiar, unfamiliar with the procedure or could simply use a refresher, 
Impeachment is the constitutional mechanism by which a president, vice president, or civil officer of the United States can be accused of, quote, treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors, unquote, and removed from office upon conviction. The specific provisions governing the process can be found in Article 1, Section 2, and Article 2, Sections 3 and 4 of the Constitution, which define the respective powers of the legislative and executive branches of uh, the federal government. But together, the provisions establish a two-step process, as explained in the 2015 study, Impeachment and uh, Removal, prepared by the Nonpartisan Congressional Research Service. Off the point here, but um, I wonder whether uh, the CRS sent a copy of that report to the president. <laughs> Quote, First, the simple majority of the House impeaches or formally approves allegations of wrongdoing uh, that amount to an impeachable offense known as Articles of Impeachment. The Articles of Impeachment are then folded to the Senate where the second proceeding takes place, an impeachment trial. You probably remember this from Bill Clinton's administration. If the Senate, by a vote of two-thirds majority, that's 67 senators, convicts the official of the alleged offenses, the result is removal from office. It should be emphasized here, I think. I want to register a comment that if the Senate should vote by a two-thirds majority, at that instant... Donald Trump is no longer the president of the United States and the vice president succeeds him in the office of the president. In other words, he has no authority once that two-thirds vote actually takes place if the Senate should decide to do it. He cannot refuse to leave the White House he is not able to command the armed forces. He's not able to command the FBI. He's not able to command anything except for perhaps a private army of his own. But outside of that, he has no authority, and it's doubtful that other people in the federal government who have appointments and offices and jobs in the federal government or people within the military or the police forces would after that follow um, his lead. Our institutions are till st too strong for that. So, it's important to, to recognize that impeachment would most probably be effective if it were accompanied by a conviction. He wouldn't be able to refuse to leave them. He would be forcibly removed from the White House under that situation. Now I want to comment. I want to offer this hypothesis. If there were no conviction and if the election went ahead and he were removed by the process of election, then between the time uh, the election was held and it was judged that he had lost, and I assume this would happen, in the hypothetical case that it would uh, happen. Then, if Donald Trump did refuse to go, 
he would mount a campaign to try to get the Electoral College to vote for him anyway. Failing that, he would have time to mobilize whatever forces in the United States he thought were loyal to him. In other words, if he lost an election, that might be much more dangerous to the security of the United States and the institutions of the United States than if he were impeached for constitutional violations. I just wanted to offer that um, as a conjecture and see what you thought of that. But I've done some thinking about how do we remove Donald Trump okay, from office, including the election alternative. And I notice that those who favor the election alternative rather than the impeachment alternative, there are many, many, many people that they all assume that if Donald Trump were legitimately beaten in an election, he would then just fade peacefully away into the night. I'm not sure that would happen. He might do everything he could at that point to use the period between November 3rd um, um, and the inauguration day of the new president on, uh, I guess it would be January 19th or January 20th, to create a situation where he might postpone the inauguration and try to take over the government in various ways. Remember, as long as he's still officially the president, he can command people in the federal government. We cannot forget that when we consider which is better, impeachment okay, or having um, an election. Of course, if an election were effective, it would have a far greater legitimacy than an impeachment process. But what I'm pointing out here is that a successful impeachment process might be more effective at accomplishing the result that we'd like to see, which is his removal from office. Going on, although scores of federal officials have been the subject of congressional impeachment, um, um, the resolution since the nation's founding. The House has referred only 19 individuals to the Senate for impeachment trials. In other words, it's very, very rare to be impeached by the House. It's only been done 19 times. 15 federal judges, including Supreme Court Justice Samuel Chase in 1805. One senator one cabinet member and two presidents, Andrew Johnson in 1868 and Bill Clinton in 1998 to 99. The Senate has conducted 16 impeachment trials, convicting eight lower court judges. The rest were acquitted. So that's the record. It's an interesting record. Uh, and uh, but, um, but Nixon, whose name is most often associated with impeachment, was never formally impeached. Rather than face certain conviction in the Senate, Nixon resigned before the full House could vote on three articles of impeachment passed by the Judiciary Committee in 1974. As the accusatory body, the House has the authority to decide what constitutes an impeachable offense in any particular instance. That's very important. There's no higher authority than the House 
in deciding what constitutes an impeachable offense. The Constitution provides only general guidance defining the grounds for impeachment as treason, uh, bribery, and other high crimes and uh, misdemeanors, unquote. While treason and bribery are clear enough to grasp the meaning of high crimes and misdemeanors, the basis most commonly invoked over the decades and which will surely be cited against Trump we have to look back to the Constitutional Convention of 1787. The Founding Fathers debated impeachment and the notion of high crimes and misdemeanors extensively at the convention. James Madison described impeachment as, quote, indispensable for defending the community against the incapacity, uh, the um, incapacity, negligence, or perfidy of the chief uh, uh, of the um, uh, the uh, uh, chief magistrate, unquote. George Mason argued, quote, no point is of more importance than that the right of impeachment should be continued. Shall any man be above justice, unquote. We really need to keep that in mind. Shall any man be above uh, uh, justice? We have seen, certainly in the last 20 to 30 years, many, many men who seem to be above justice. It seemed almost routine that certain people in certain stations or certain positions would escape justice. For example, those who committed the war crimes okay, of torture, bombing civilians, and the various other things that our forces have been guilty of, Okay, in other nations. And that our chief executives have been guilty of. And of course, it's notorious that, uh, that many policemen who murder people also escape justice when clearly murder has occurred. Going on with the article, um, Benjamin Franklin quipped dryly that impeachment was preferable to the European method of displacing a king, uh, namely assassination. But of all the founders, Alexander Hamilton is credited with defining the scope of impeachment in Federalist Paper Number 65, written in 1788. Hamilton described the legal process as embracing not only overt criminal conduct, but also serious violations of the, quote, public trust, unquote. Trump, note, has been violating the public trust since his first day in the presidency by profiting at his hotels from his presidency. And since a lot of those guests at the hotels were foreign guests, that's also a violation of the Emoluments Clause of the Constitution, and a very clear one, and also, of course, a violation of the public trust. Going on with the article. True to Hamilton's reasoning, over the course of our history, charges of high crimes and uh, misdemeanors have been alleged for a wide array of wrongdoing, both criminal and non-criminal, including abuse of power, obstruction of justice, uh, uh, corruption, bribery, and perjury. No one, not even Nixon, is more deserving of impeachment than Donald John Trump, in the opinion of the author, clearly, but in my opinion, too. In 2015, while Trump was a presidential candidate, I warned of the dangers he posed to immigrants 
the First Amendment, and civil rights and liberties in general. Soon after the election, I began writing about his inevitable impeachment. The principal debate now among the mainstream Democrats and progressives is no longer whether Trump should be impeached, but how extensive the articles drafted against him should be. Well before the Ukraine scandal erupted into public view last week courtesy of a whistleblower's complaint, Trump was liable for a long laundry list of impeachable offenses. Among the many derelictions I have cited, Trump can credibly be accused of committing campaign finance violations by paying hush money to two women with whom he allegedly had extramarital affairs. Karen McDougal and porn star Stormy Daniels. Obstructing justice in connection with the investigation by special counsel Robert uh, Mueller. Now, I have some doubts about that. I know he obstructed the investigation. I've just never seen any evidence, actually seen evidence, that proved or came close to proving that there was something to obstruct there other than the investigation itself. But legally, from a legal point of view, all you have to do is to obstruct an investigation to be found guilty of obstructing justice. That's true. But um, as a political matter, uh, the public uh, wants to believe that there has to be something there for you to be obstructing justice. And I'm afraid that while uh, our intelligence agencies and our various um, departments of government have frequently existed, insisted that uh, that Russia Gate was real. They've never produced any hard evidence that it was. We just have to take their word for it. Apart from that, though, I have to note that if the people take their word for it and they believe uh, in Russia Gate then uh, the reason why this would be considered obstructing justice commonsensically might be acceptable to people okay, in the larger public. Next, defying congressional subpoenas. Yes, that alone is it's a violation of separation of powers. It's a violation of the Constitution by uh, the uh, Chief Executive Officer of the United States. It would be a crime if Congress held him in contempt, which I believe it will if this inquiry goes forward and stonewalling by the executive branch continues then I believe that officers in the executive branch who are defying the subpoenas will be held in contempt of Congress. And since they're under orders from the chief executive to be doing this, probably the chief executive himself will then be held in contempt. And then that will be grounds for impeachment right there. And there's using the presidency for personal um, economic um, gain, yes, by failing to divest himself of his business interests while he sat um, in the presidency. He provided a means for him to personally gain from um, his presidency outside of the compensation that was awarded to him uh, by uh, the laws passed by Congress. 
He clearly has been using the presidency for his personal economic gain and for gains going to his family. Next, okay, is his abuse of the pardon power to reward political allies. I mean, that too is an abuse of power. That's a high crime, okay, and misdemeanor. That's illegal. He attacked the press um, and the judiciary continuously. That can be defined by Congress as a high crime, okay, and misdemeanor. Easily, no problem. Especially since the attacks have been incessant. There are many cases okay, of such attacks. You can criticize the press without attacking the press. Without taking actions against the press that are punitive and that attack the freedom of the press. But that's not what Trump has done. He did not reply to criticism with simple criticism in return. He replied by trying to get even. Next, threatening to prosecute uh, one's political opponents. That too is illegal. That's tyrannical. One of the main reasons for having the Constitution in the first place, one of the main reasons for uh, the, uh, the revolution, um, um, the American Revolution, was to get rid of tyrants who prosecuted uh, their political opponents, those who dissented from what they wanted to do and dissented from their pronouncements. That was one of the big reasons why we got rid of King George, the kings of England in general, because they put their political opponents in the damn tower. Next is abusing emergency powers to build his um, um, border wall. Yes, he did. He did that. We saw that. He shifted money from certain areas of the federal government to other areas to build his border wall, from a defense budget to build his border wall. He declared a state of emergency to do this when there was clearly no emergency at all. It's not even disputable. He incarcerated undocumented immigrant children in concentration camps. That's against international law and treaties signed by the United States. It's a human rights crime. He committed that. It's a violation of law and of treaty, as I said. He's guilty of attempting to strip millions of Americans of health insurance. Now that may not be illegal, but by those millions, it may certainly be considered a breach of the public trust. He is guilty of having tax reform, not for any public purpose, but to benefit the super rich for no apparent reason, except that they wanted to get a little richer. What is it, 85% of the benefits of the recent tax cuts went to the super rich? Why was that done? It wasn't done for any public purpose. It did not in any way contribute to the general welfare. It was strictly an instance of crony capitalism. 
It's a good political ground for impeaching the guy. He has gutted environmental regulations and pulled us out of the Paris uh, Climate Accord. Now, that may be a purely political thing to do, but it seems to me it goes beyond politics when all the science is saying that by doing these things, he's jeopardizing our very survival and the survival of our children and our grandchildren. I think that presidents can be impeached for that. Next, he's refusing to enforce the Voting Rights Act. Yes, he did. He refused to enforce it. And he still refuses to enforce it. Now, the Voting Rights Act is mandated by Congress. He has an obligation as the chief executive of the United States to enforce the Voting Rights Act. He is not performing his duty, and it's a rather sacred duty because most of us think that people should have the right to vote and that it shouldn't be removed from them because they belong to particular groups of people. That's what he has been doing. And of course, he's been curbing the use of federal consent uh, decrees to counter the misconduct of the police. Yes, he has. What purpose does that serve? What public purpose does it serve? other than to create an authoritarian situation inside of the United States. Now, there's a bullet point on this list, which is not even mentioned. Okay. It is, it has, he has made uh, various pronouncements that uh, have basically stated or implied that if he lost the election of 2020, that he would not leave the office of the presidency, that he would not respect the verdict of the country replacing him with someone else. And he has more than broadly hinted, more than broadly hinted through statements he has made, that he could defeat the outcome of an election process by mobilizing his political base against the rest of the country. He has said things like that. He has been the boldest politician since um, Aaron Burr to suggest that if things go do not go his way, then he might be forced to incite a revolution. No other president of the United States has come close to doing that. I'm sorry, I forgot about well, it's true, no president of the United States has come close to doing that. That was done, though, obviously, by Jefferson Davis, who was part of uh, the rebellion of the South. Anyway, going on. Uh, the mafia-like shakedown of uh, the, uh, the Ukraine president, um, 
Volodymyr Zelensky as reflected in the declassified uh, the, uh, the memorandum of telephone conversation, the memcom that details the July 25th conversation uh, between the leaders only adds fuel to an already raging fire. As shown by the memcom, which is organized in the form of an edited transcript, the American president promised to release uh, uh, um, had promised to release American military assistance to Ukraine in return for a favor. Specifically, that uh, by Zelensky used the power of his office to investigate alleged Ukrainian support for the Democrats during the 2016 American presidential campaign, as well as alleged corruption charges involving Joe Biden and his son, uh, Hunter. Trump urged um, Zelensky to talk to and cooperate with Attorney General William Barr and Trump's private attorney, former New York City Mayor Rudy Giuliani, for both purposes. And Bill Blum says, this is an abuse of power in black and white aimed at using a foreign government to bring down a political rival. Arguably, it may also establish the elements of two federal felonies, extortion, um, um, and also bribery. Well, I'm not sure the Memcon is quite so cut and dried as that. Um, I've read it, and you may want to read it um, as well. Uh, we don't have uh, the exact wording of the transcript. Uh, it's a consensus of those who listened in as to what was said. Uh, there is no recording because after Nixon, recordings of that sort of thing were stopped at uh, the, uh, the White House. Uh, so, uh, we don't have a recording. We don't know for certain what exactly was, uh, was said. If the Memcon uh, is correct, there's certainly a basis for saying that uh, this was a violation and impeachable. It certainly justifies, I think, an inquiry into um, um, impeachment. But uh, even though it perhaps may be a smoking gun, it's not entirely clear that Trump um, actually discharged uh, uh, the gun. <laughs> there are some people disputing it. Let's put it that way. It seemed like it was pretty plain to me that that's what was going on. And impeachment doesn't take place in a court of law. So maybe there's enough evidence to have the impeachment based um, um, on this. There's a pretty good case for it. We have to watch the polls and see whether the public thinks that that's what Trump okay, was doing. And in the end, I think it's going to come down to that. If the polls move against Trump in a very serious way, as they've been moving over the last, what, I guess over the last week or so, if they can you continue to move in that way, then people will have accepted the evidence of uh, the, quote, transcript, um, unquote. And they will be accepting that as a violation, obviously. But there's much more to impeach Trump on than just that. And I've said a number of times here before, 
there needs to be a broader inquiry, a much broader inquiry. Trump upped the impeachment ante in a talk at a private event in New York, comparing information leakers and whistleblowers to traitors, okay, deserving the death penalty. So there it is. Talk like that itself is unconstitutional. It goes beyond the pale. And whistleblowers trying to reveal the crimes of government are not traitors to the United States. Trump may be able to say those kinds of things as a private um, citizen, but he can't say it as the President of the United States because his repeating of that is dangerous. The chief executive is calling on uh, the government to heavily prosecute people who are whistleblowers and who have laws protecting them, which the government is obviously routinely violating anyway. That's true. But calling whistleblowers traitors, okay, deserving of the death penalty, is beyond the pale, in my view, of what a president should be doing. He said, quote, you know what we used to do in the old days when we were smart, right? The spies and treason we used to handle it a little differently than we do now. Um, 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 unquote. Treason is hard to prove. In a court of law, it's hard to prove. With all the harm that Trump himself has done to the United States, a treason case against him would be absolutely thrown out of court, even if there was something to rush against, even if that was valid. A charge of treason against him would never occur. Because treason is about siding with enemies in a time of war. And in case we've never noticed, it's been a long time since the United States actually declared a war against anybody. Maybe we need to go back to constitutional procedures and declare wars then we might be able to charge people with treason. Instead, what we do today is we use the Espionage Act. In trials where the accused cannot even provide justification for why they committed the acts they committed. They can't even use that as self-defense. It's ruled out of order under the Espionage Act. Which, by the way, suggests to me that the Espionage Acts passed now in, what, in 1919, that those acts, in fact, are unconstitutional, and it's high time the courts did something about that. Still, the issue of where to draw the line of the articles of impeachment against Trump is tricky. Impeachment is a political process, but it bears similarities to criminal prosecution. And as any experienced defense attorney can tell you, more than a few strong prosecutions have failed due to overcharging, which can complicate, mar, and muddy an otherwise straightforward um, by narrative. Paren, as a young lawyer, for example, I won the reversal of a defendant's conviction of attempted murder that stemmed from overcharging, according to the published opinion issued by the California Court of Appeals. Tell the story of the malfeasance and corruption of Donald Trump. Three articles of impeachment. So this is what Blum is recommending. The same number that forced Nixon from the Oval Office should suffice. Uh, the abuse of power for Ukraine. Using the presidency for personal gain. Obstruction of justice for the Mueller investigation and the wholesale defiance of congressional subpoenas. Uh, it seems to me the wholesale defiance of congressional subpoenas 
is actually a fourth item and should be made a separate item. And I'm not sure about the persuasiveness of either the first item or the obstruction of justice for the mother investigation. But the other two, using the presidency for personal gain and the wholesale uh, defiance of uh, 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 congressional subpoenas, the idea that those are valid grounds for impeachment and that impeachment should occur because of those, that seems like a very tight argument um, um, to me. Uh, but I would recommend that we go further and we charge the president with uh, also violations of treaties agreed to the United States defining the uh, human rights okay, of migrants. Trump has clearly been extremely guilty okay, of that and that he be charged further with, uh, with war crimes for the actions of the United States in supporting the Saudis in the Yemeni bombings. We have gone too far there. Those are war crimes. The president should be impeached uh, for those. And if the answer to that is, well, um, Obama committed similar war crimes, I would say to that, Obama is no longer the president of the United States. He is not in office. It's up to the Congress of the United States to remove people from office. That is what impeachment is about. After that, it's up to the courts to charge people with crimes. If people choose to seek justice in court, against Trump and Obama um, and George Bush, then let them go ahead and try to get justice um, in the courts. But beginning this process happens with the removal of a president um, from office. So I think the fourth ground should be war crimes committed by Trump as the commander-in-chief of the United States Armed um, Forces. And I say, let the chips fall, they may, fall where they may with respect to that. Now, Democrats have little to fear from a Trump impeachment. The current situation is much more akin to 1974, which saw Nixon's popularity steadily erode until his resignation then to 1999, which saw Bill Clinton's popularity climb. I completely agree with that. Completely agree with it. It's not like 1999 at all. Trump will not escape uh, the way Bill Clinton did. He will not escape. But, uh, but by the way, I didn't notice the Republicans suffering very much for their idiotic impeachment of Bill Clinton um, during the election of 2000. Instead, I saw Gore not being willing to run strongly on Clinton's record for fear that would, there would be some, um, some penalty, and as a result having this extremely tight election, which was awarded by the Supreme Court uh, to George W. Bush, of course, as we know. I have to say, which a Republican Supreme Court 
actually awarded to George W. Bush. And if you think there was nothing partisan in that particular decision, I have a bridge to sell you, the proverbial one between Brooklyn and Manhattan. A CBS, <laughs> a CBS news poll released Sunday showed a whopping 55% of respondents favor the impeachment um, inquiry. Yes, uh, that had uh, actually by 10 points, 55 to 45. And a Quinnipiac poll survey released on Monday went beyond the inquiry, finding respondents evenly split 47 to 47. And whether they support impeaching President Trump and removing him from office, a 10-point swing in favor of impeachment over a five-day period. Now, as these various grounds for impeachment um, come out, if people don't agree with one of them or two of them, if there are five charges and even more, people will agree with some of them, including Republicans. Even if Republicans find him not guilty in the Senate on some of the charges, like, for example, Russiagate. Or maybe uh, you know the Ukraine Gate charge, but find him guilty on the emoluments charge. That's enough for them to vote for um, impeachment. And similarly, when it comes to polling, the more charges there are that seem valid, the more support there will be for impeachment as we go through this particular period. So we need more charges. We need more grounds. The inquiry should not be restricted to the single ground of the Ukrainian incident. As the congressional impeachment hearings move forward, public support can be expected to increase. Even if the Senate refuses to convict, Trump's um, the re-election prospects will be crippled as Democrats will be able to target Trump and the GOP in the 2020 elections for betraying the Constitution. I agree with that. Okay. I think that is bound to happen. This will disempower the election campaign okay, of Trump. He can scream partisanship all he likes, but when the evidence comes out for multiple charges and people see the hearings as they will, as they will, Trump's base will begin to shrink. I'm telling you, he will fall into the 30s. And the Republicans, if they know it's good for them, will begin to run away from him. They've already started to some degree. And for the progressive left, impeachment represents a rare opportunity to hold a tyrant to account. I couldn't agree more with that. Holding a tyrant to account is important. It's important. And to merge the impeachment issue with a broader agenda for genuine social and political change. While some of the progressives may balk at forging a tactical alliance with mainstream Democrats, the choice should be a no-brainer. The impeachment train has left the station. Either get on board and help steer, stand aside, or get run over, says Bill Blum, who wrote this for Truth Dig. on September 30th, just yesterday. Okay, so I posted a link to another article uh, from Truth Dig called Trump has committed a laundry list of impeachable offenses. Uh, that article was cited in the one that I just read and it was written by um, Amy Goodman, 
and uh, um, 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 also um, by Dennis Moynihan, who I believe is her brother, if I recall correctly. And they developed uh, the, uh, the laundry list. So I urge you to read that. I'm not going to go over that article. I've been here okay, for an hour and a half. It's time to take your questions and comments. And I'm going to do that uh, right now. Here we go. There we go. That's a little better. Let me go over to Facebook and check you out. And let me read out your comments. So Dolores Pierce joined also. Hiya, Dolores. And Rich Serber has joined. Sam Hollenbeck says, hi, Dolores. And Stephen Wolfbrand says, hi, Dr. Joe. Hi, Steve. And Cora Manuel says, hi, everybody. Sam Hollenbeck says, hi, Cora. And uh, from Evelina Apont, we have the comment, CEOs are a class all onto their own. Well, the CEOs are the major companies. I mean, remember, there are CEOs of small companies, too. They're not a class of their own, <laughs> of their very own. Cora says, hi, Sam. And Christy Yazdi says, um, hello, everyone. Hi, Christy. And Don Adams has joined, and Greg Mallard says, I'd love to see what Amazon would look like. Also, Dolores says, I'm on the road now, and we'll watch later. Thank you, Dolores. And Evelina Punt says, does Bernie subscribe to, to MMT? Not uh, publicly, Evelina. Not publicly. But I suspect that privately he believes there is a lot to MMT because his chief economic advisor for his campaign is still Stephanie Kelton, who it can fairly be said is now clearly in the top rank of MMT economists. I'd say right at this point that she's among the big four. She's in the big four, which was formerly a big three. Warren Chamberlain has joined, and Cora Emanuel says, if Trump is removed from office through impeachment, can he still run for president in 2020? Does impeachment bar a president from ever being elected again? Uh, off the top of my head, I don't know. I will refresh my memory of the clauses in the Constitution okay, and get back to you um, uh, on that. But of course, uh, if he is impeached, and removed, okay, from office, then all manner of things can be done to put a serious crimp in his campaign, such as the release of all kinds of communications that he made, okay, with others that his successor in the presidency 
uh, may want to make public so that he never has a chance, okay, of getting elected again. Some other things that are likely to happen is he's likely to be immediately slapped with an indictment uh, from the state of New York for various things that he's done there. He, you know, they're only refraining, okay, from indicting him at this point, most probably, because he's uh, still the president of the United States. Now, while strictly speaking, he could be indicted by the state of New York, even as president of the United States. That may be a bridge too far for the attorney general of New York to attempt uh, but anyway, I'll check for you. I don't believe it prohibits the impeached person from um, holding public office again. So the person may still run for the presidency. But I think once the person involved uh, does not have uh, the support of incumbency, Okay, in running again, I think that person is very unlikely to win because I think the president who is then the incumbent may want himself to run or the Republican Party having looked so bad in the process of impeachment may want to nominate um, someone who is not at all connected with that um, impeachment. I still believe that a likely candidate for them to run in 2020 in case of impeachment and removal from office, okay, of Donald Trump could be Senator Romney. Senator Mitt Romney. I believe if anybody is likely to go over from the Republicans to the other side in an impeachment proceeding in the Senate, a trial proceeding in the Senate, it's likely to be Mitt Romney, for sure. And Rodolfo Cortez joined. Hey, Rodolfo, how are you? Really nice to see you. And my wife, Bonnie, joined. Hi, honey. And my brother, Hal, joined. Hi, Hal. And Bennett Robert joined. Um, um, hi, Bennett. This may be the first time you've been here. I don't recall your name exactly, but you're quite welcome. Thank you for coming. Uh, uh, Ivalana Pont says, how might an impeachment affect uh, world events already in progress? Um, almost immediately. I don't know what impact it would have. It depends on what Trump actually does. If he does something extreme in that particular situation, the effect it might have could be uh, to simply speed his impeachment and conviction so as to remove him from office so that he cannot create a crisis. In other words, everybody in that situation would be afraid of the wag the dog scenario. Where the dog, of course, is the nation. Nicole Brin says, gas prices are going up again, so maybe that. Uh, I don't think that's really serious enough to stop an impeachment. Nicole Brin says, uh, remember when Trump shut down the government? Where did that money go? Business didn't stop while we were shut down. Well, the government wasn't completely shut down. It's... Uh, non-essential functions were shut down. It wasn't okay, entirely shut down. Uh, taxes were still coming in. Certain spending was still going on. 
in particularly essential functions. And uh, he was not himself able to shut down the government. The reason why the government was shut down was that actually Congress uh, um, um, hadn't come to agreement on the debt ceiling uh, um, at the time. So no more deficit spending could be done, and that's what shut down the essential functions, uh, I'm sorry, not essential functions of the government. So it's within the control of the Congress to do something about that. In other words, raising the debt ceiling, okay, is up to them. Of course, Trump could um, always refuse to sign a bill um, 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 actually raising the debt ceiling, but if he did that, he would probably immediately be impeached and convicted by the Senate. <laughs> would probably happen overnight uh, just so the government could open up again. So Louisa Connors joined um, hi, Louisa. Susan Beaver has joined. Uh, also, Nicole Brent says, remember when he held food stamps hostage? Yes, I do remember when he held food stamps hostage. And Nicole says, uh, you guys don't need to respond. I'm just talking. That's okay. People can just talk here. And I will, I will respond with opinions and comments and such. Uh, so, Evelina Apont says, who can forget? Terrible, but I'd like to know how it would affect um, uh, Brexit, the Iran War, and also Venezuela. If impeachment uh, were dragged out, and took a long time. Trump might be motivated to do all kinds of things to heat up the international situation to try to shut down impeachment proceedings. You know, essentially appealing to national security. He would not himself be able to shut it down, but he may be able to place um, all kinds of pressure on the Congress to shut things down. On the other hand, if he would deliberately, okay, if he were to bring us into war in what was an obvious attempt to try to overturn what the Congress was doing, his cabinet might simply vote to displace him in uh, the presidency okay, uh, on grounds of his unfitness to hold the office and deposit um, uh, by Trump in the presidency uh, using the law Congress passed in order to replace a president who was obviously unfit for office um, in various ways. So I can't say how it would affect um, by those things. And it's good to try to think through the possibilities of what Trump would do and what he wouldn't do. <laughs> and by the way, what he would do and what he wouldn't do would be subject to negotiation. And he might well try to hold things hostage. So even if people insisted on removing him um, from the government, he would have conditions sufficient to avoid any further punishments for himself. He's certainly likely to try to negotiate that. Uh, Rosemary Robertson joined. And Amber Lee Aurora Grigo joined. 
Hi, Rosemary, and hi, um, um, Amber Lee, who says again, hello, my lovelies. Okay. And the cold brin says, oh, yes, that's rigged. Thank you, cool channel. <laughs> okay, and Amber Lee says, food prices are going up, not related to impeachment, though. My grocery store was out of celery for the first time in my life. Weird. Yeah, that is weird. That is weird. Um, our grocery store here in Northern Virginia, fairly close to D.C., uh, was not out of anything, including celery, including rice, cauliflower, and also broccoli slaw, and all the exotic products you find around the Washington, D.C. area. for the sophisticated cosmopolites who live here. Okay, any other comments? I ask that because it's getting close to my witching hour. I will quickly once again flash up my please share, like, and subscribe sign and my please become a patron at www.patreon.com front slash Joe underscore Firestone. Then I will take another look at uh, Facebook to see whether you've added anything else. I don't see anything. So I say to you all, thank you very much for coming. Have a very good night. I'll be back um, tomorrow night. Uh, and hopefully I may be able to get off this impeachment kick and get back onto the other issues we must face in short order, like the climate emergency, uh, also a broken health care system. Also, the systematic uh, corruption in our government. Russ says, see you next time. Thank you, Russell. See you next time as well. And Cara, thank you for coming. Cara says, thank you, Joe, and good night. And thank you to everyone for coming. It's been fun. <laughs>